I wanted to make a Fawn costume for years, so I think I have enough things in my stash at this point. I should have most of Fern covered. Let's go over what I have. These horns, but that's not what she has. These, kind of more demon cow horns. I don't think the directions that these sit on my head are necessarily going to get the right effect. I'll probably end up making them and these can be for my custom fawn version later. I've got some adorable little sheepy ears. I've got this little blush on them. The heelless shoes, these were trendy for a little while. This is left over from my Raven Queen costume. So it has a lot of pieces that I'm going to need to take off. It also is open-toed and this was just added for the other costume so it won't offer as much support but if I can encase the entire foot in some kind of sock shape it should be enough to hold things in place. This uh, was gifted to me by a co-worker who thought I could use the pleather but this should have some nice rounded upholstery foam. I've got some old leggings I don't wear anymore. Should be able to glue my upholstery foam right to these. I have my two furs. This is a little more rose tinged than I would pick out for fern specifically, but I think it's close enough I can work with it. And this is for the inner legs and some spots. And they're both just like really nice and soft, so I don't know, you can take a nap on my legs at the convention because it'll be just like the fuzziest pillow. This was from my Cole from Dragon Age cosplay and it's just a stretch velvet in kind of a dark brown and this will probably be for my lower legs. Let's get to it. My first step is to free my shoes from the previous cosplay. If your own shoes have decorations, you'll want to remove those too. Ideally, your pair would have minimal buckles but still hold your feet in well. I'm beginning with the understructure of the legs. My foam is already curved nicely, so I just need to cut it in half, as well as to the length of my thighs. Then I can work to round down the sharp edges at the top and bottom. Mostly working from the underside helps to preserve the smooth curve already present. During the process, I tested it against my leg a lot to get a feel for the overall shape, and if the top and bottom joint are still too sharp. My original plan was to spray glue the foam to my leggings while wearing them, but it wasn't holding. So instead, I made spandex tubes the size of my legs plus the padding, and stitched it in place. Elastic straps with velcro are great for holding the foam in place while doing this, and I'd recommend sewing the tube on while wearing the leggings to make sure there's enough stretch. For the calves, I use some offcuts of foam in a wedge shape and sew a patch of spandex around to keep it in place. It's pretty hard to twist to sew the back of your own calf, so find a friend if you can. You'll want them for the next part. When you're happy with your leg shape, it's time to prepare for patterning. Wrap yourself in saran wrap. With a symmetrical design, you should be able to wrap just one leg, but try to cover your whole abdomen. I had trouble doing that alone and regretted it later. After you're wrapped up like leftovers, cover the saran with duct tape. Try to get some vertical pieces as well as horizontal so your pattern won't distort as much. Also, try not to wrap it too tightly. If you're covered up nice, you can start drawing your pattern. Burns is pretty simple, with just a white patch on the inner thigh. I also indicate where I want to switch materials, like the velvet and the tuft of longer fur on the calf. It can also help to mark locations you might want to add a seam, like the ankle and around the sole of the shoe. With the pattern decided, it's time to cut yourself to freedom. Be sure to cut the saran rather than your tights or yourself. It is what it's there for. Now it's time to make this pattern sewable. The goal is to make your piece flat using as few seams as you can. It could be a big help if you already have parts that are a different color because you can use a seam that would already exist instead of adding darts to a solid color. The white inner thigh means I can eliminate the inseam and keep it all one piece. Because the front has such a large curve, it still needs a seam and some darts to help it fit tight and smooth. 
Since I'm making a fawn, I want the lower leg to be less bulky. Using stretch velvet for the lower leg keeps it slimmer and means I only need one seam at the back, as well as an oval patch for the calf for the tuft of longer fur. The foot is broken down to two pieces for the foot, an outer and an inner, and two for the hoof, around and the bottom. Cutting fabric is the easiest part of this project. For the calf and feet, I'm using stretch fabric so it's important that the stretch runs horizontal, the pile lays down, and all pieces are oriented the same. Make sure you add seam allowance. The hoofs are made of spandex, though a stretch pleather might be more convincing. Fern's hooves are shiny and emerald green, but if you're making a more realistic fawn, a dark brown is going to be better. The seam here also goes at the back. The tufts are cut off screen, but are basically ovals with a dart cut in. To keep the long pile out of the seam, I'm sewing it closed by hand. The feet and legs are basically boot covers or fancy socks. First, I join the upper hooves to the lower hooves, resulting in an off-balance tube. Next, I sew the upper feet, inside and outside, together, and sew the bottom edge to the upper edge of the hooves. To make sure they fit well, I try them on over the shoes before going further. The calves are sewn up the back, making yet more tubes. This time, there's a hole open for the tufts, which I hand sew in place, making sure the grain of the fur brushes down. Then, the leg warmer part can join to the shoe part, making our fawny boot covers. Here's why you should duct tape your butt. Because I couldn't tape that high on my own, I've had to merge this pattern with the top of a pant sloper, taking an educated guess where to place my leg pieces and how to merge the seams. The fit ended up too short at my lower back. With fur, it's important to make sure it lays the right way. In this case, it should be brushed down. Friends have recommended using an X-Acto knife on the back of the fur to avoid piles of fluff, so I tried, but eventually got impatient. Instead, I used fabric scissors, but tried to keep the blade flush with the canvas to avoid trimming much of the fur. Repeat this for the rest of the brown fur as well as the cream fur. To fit such large pieces on my fabric, I added an extra seam where the stomach meets the inner thigh and hand sew it together. Then I hand sew all the darts. That's really slow going, so when I get to the seams, I clip it together, being sure to brush the fur out of the seams. Then I use a zigzag stitch over the edges and repeat for each leg. Since my pant pattern was questionable, I tried on the legs over the padding. If you're not sure about your own, I'd suggest adding a lot of seam allowance. For myself, I ended up adding a gusset, a whole other panel, to the front stomach. You won't see it with Fern's dress, but I wanted a deer tail. The top was made of triangular scraps, but a single wider petal shape would probably be better. For the fluffy underside, you want about one third of a circle, with one edge being as long as the top fur, and the other being one third of how big you want your base circumference. They were cut from extra fluffy white fur with the pile aimed down. Sew all three pieces together like a pyramid, leaving the base open for now. Stuff it with batten and or your offcuts from the egg foam. When it holds its shape, you can draw a circle about the size of its opening. I added two pieces of elastic across the circle so it can be worn as a belt or pinned in place. Then, use this piece to close up your tail, making sure the elastic lays vertically. The brown fur ended up longer than the extra white panel, so I decided to close my pants with a snap on either side of it. I can pull one edge through the elastic of the tail when closing it to keep both on. Time for a test drive. So far, we've got some wearable furry pants, but these ones need some fawn spots. I use pieces of masking tape to get an idea of where I want the spots to be. Then I can draw ovals of a similar size on my white fur, keeping the grain in mind. When I'm ready to sew, I remove the masking tape one at a time and replace it with fur, and top stitch the white spot to the top. If you're working on bulkier fur, you'll want to cut the spot out of your base fur and stitch the spot in place, or at least shave down the area to avoid bulging. Hand sewing spots is slow, but rewarding. The ears are made of two petal shapes each, one out of pink fleece for the skin and one out of the main fur. 
Sew the edges together, leaving the part that sits against your head open to turn. To give them some depth, I dry brush the inner ear with pink paint in two shades. Ear tufts are extra cute, so I stitch some offcuts of the long white fur along the pink side of the upper ear edge. None of the horns in my collection were really the right shape, so I opted to try a new method. To start, I took a few strands of wire and tried to rough out the shape. Then I used duct tape to join and solidify them. This left me with a really flat spiral. After measuring their length, I cut strips of foam to bulk up both of the sides and duct tape them to the base. This can be a pretty finicky process to get the right shape, so try it on and adjust often. When the shape is good, I still need to create a horn texture. For that, I choose to wrap them with yarn. By hot gluing a stripe down the back and front of my duct tape face, a bit at a time, and pressing the wrapped wool into it, I can secure it in place without adding too much extra weight. In the end, these were still too heavy and too spindly, so I solved both by folding the first six or so inches back on itself and rewrapping that portion to blend it in. The problem with this is it made the base very round and tippy. To fix it, I cut out cardboard discs marked where the base should be, and cut tabs radially along that edge. Glue the horns into the disc and fold up the tabs. Secure them with duct tape. The focus here is wearability, so use an awl to poke holes in the sides of the horn big enough to push a headband through, then cover the join with even more yarn. I also stitch the ears shut and to the headband. For painting, I went with acrylic off the bat, but should have used a primer because it took a ton of paint. Actually, I should have used brown yarn to begin with, but this was in my stash. After completing the base, I worked my colors lighter with bronze and gold metallic paints to try to get some shine. The ends should be lighter than the base because they're more transparent on real horns. The final highlights are with pearlescent white. If you have access to an airbrush, it's great for blending the transition between colors or adding depth to the fur. Just a bit along the edge of my tail made it so much more convincing. I also shade the bottoms of the legs where they curve in and the transition from cream to brown. One thing to keep in mind is that an airbrush only leaves pigment in the path of the air, so a few wrinkles in your fabric will result in unpainted stripes. Fern specifically has Clydesdale-like fur around her hooves in green, so I've got more long fur offcuts, the length of her hooves circumference, to paint. I started with brown at the bottom and underside, and green on top to give more depth. Again, the paint travels by air, so the inner fluff remained very white. I also tried to add some green to the feet of my fawn booties, but the acrylic ink I used wouldn't show up on such a dark velvet. I also tried dabbing it on with a brush to see if more pigment would help, but not really. When the fur traps are dry, I stitch them into the booties in a few key places rather than all around, so there's more flexibility if I need to take the shoes out later. Now we need some poisonous mushrooms for the feet. I'm making this out of foam clay and each is made of two balls. The first is rolled into a rough tube and the bottom is flattened. The second is rolled, then pinched flat along the edges, and radiant grooves are drawn on the underside. They're joined together, then skewered with wire, leaving a few inches sticking out. This allows them to stand to dry, and later the stem will be used to secure them on my hooves. Vary up the sizes and proportions to feel more organic. The mushroom painting is pretty simple. The caps are red with brown dry brush for shading, both are acrylic paint. I also paint the gills and stems, and wipe off the excess while it's still damp, to give it the feel of growing out of the dirt. When the paint is thoroughly dry, it's time to dab some white spots on. Find some reference of red caps first to get a feel for the spot placement, and don't worry about making perfect circles, they'll look less organic. Using the floral stem, I weave the mushrooms into the hoof fluff and fold the ends so they won't slip out. If you want extra security, twist the loops at the ends and stitch them to your fur. All that's left for the boots is to paint the toe groove into the hooves with some black acrylic. And that should be everything you need to make your fawn bits. Part 2 will cover Fern's clothing and accessories. The upside of this video taking a while is that I've gotten to wear Fern a few times and have an idea of what worked. First, the base shoes are terrible to walk in on any non-flat surface, 
For convention wear, I switched to normal high heels covered in fur and only have the knockout heels for photos. There's tread on the shoes to make them a little more wearable. There's a snap on each that connects it to the top of the leggies. The other big change was the headband. The one I used for Fern's horns and ears was way too small for my head with the wig on and too back heavy. You can see, there's just there's a bar of warbler, a pair of Chicago screws, ears snap on with little wig combs. The flowers are either twisted around the horns to give kind of a natural viney look or hot glued directly to them. And I can't think of anything else, so I hope this is it. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye. Sorry this took so long. I tried a different video editing program and hated it. Going forward, videos will probably be irregular because one a month is hard to keep up with with a full-time job and conventions running again. But there's more I'm hoping to put out soon. Thanks for watching.